Hello, and welcome to the twelfth episode of If Women Were Meant to Fly, the Sky Would Be Pink, Changing Perceptions, Part 2, Getting Down to Business. I'm Ina Dotun. In this episode, as I continue to build my flight hours for promotion to senior first officer, I decide to take on my detractors. I meet many different characters on board some of my flights, more interesting weather comes my way, and I find that I cannot emulate all the aspects of a behind-the-scenes commercial pilot. My life was busy, busier than I could ever have imagined. I was flying a lot, and by a lot I mean my schedules were ever-changing, such as the life of a pilot. My regular four sectors a day became back-to-back sectors on some days. A typical day for me would be an 0700 AM lagos Worry port harcourt two-sector flight with an immediate quick turnaround return direct Lagos flight. Or sometimes I would complete a four-sector flight, Lagos, Worry, Port Harcourt, Worry, Lagos, and then fly a Lagos, Worry, night stop, or a Lagos, Worry, Port Harcourt, night stop, ending 12 hours later. Phew! We night stopped on the Shell compound in Port Harcourt in those early days, which was a 30-minute car ride in a Volkswagen Beetle for the cruise. Often we would be required to tag on to the passenger motorcade with an accompanying police escort for safety. The road out to the airport was a dangerous one in those days. Armed robbery was rife, and you couldn't be sure what would await you on these journeys. Sometimes the dispatcher would direct the cars to leave without us, and then we would be left to fend for ourselves on the journey back. Quite how they proposed to run the regular morning flights if we had been ambushed and possibly killed the night before was a mystery. Well, quite apart from our demise. There were checkpoints to negotiate as well, and even in uniform we didn't always get waved through, unless we had our added security. I'd obviously grown up in Lagos for a lot of my life, so I was somewhat used to living in a volatile environment, where you lived on your wits and life was cheap. But I realise writing this now, how this contrasts with life here in the UK today. Once in the secure compound, we were housed in dedicated crew quarters, which consisted of a double bungalow, one side for the captain and the other side for the co-pilot. Meals were provided at the guest house restaurant, which was a short walk away. The compound had been built on reclaimed forest, and we had the dubious pleasure, most mornings, of waking up to a selection of grass snakes and others on the patio through which we had to navigate a path if we wanted to leave. Since we also had a helicopter operation in Port Harcourt, we would sometimes be invited to the Bristow Clubhouse. In those days, the co-pilots were not always welcome. I was once drunkenly told at the bar that I was okay as I was half British. That was meant to be a compliment. I was insulted and responded with, hmm, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be here. There were a few loaded comments in those days. Sometimes I thought it was because the expatriate pilots and engineers were unused to having female colleagues present when they let their hair down. And although I am not proud of it, I was very soon not shy of firing back as good as I got. Because I was young, I was still learning what was acceptable and what was not, what was said in jest and what had sinister undertones. Much of it was said in alcohol-laced conversations. But I'm pretty certain that in many cases, this alcohol was not the driver. That person's true character was showing itself. About two years after I joined the company, I was flying a late afternoon sector to Worry with an onward night stop in Port Harcourt when we had an engine surge. Fixed wing engineers were in Lagos and it was decided to fly them down to us the following morning. Well, that meant we were stuck in Worry with no arranged accommodation as this was not a usual night stop location at the time. I had made really good friends with one of our helicopter engineers based in Worry, whose wife I had also got to know really well. They were such a lovely, welcoming couple and I looked forward to spending lots of time with them when I could. 
I called them from the dispatch line and they were only too happy to put me and my captain up for the night. When I returned to the aircraft, the chief pilot had arrived to arrange our accommodation. I told him I had it all sorted and explained that we would be picked up by my friend. His face clouded over and he took me to one side. He said, when you stay here, you people stay with your own. I asked him to repeat what he had just said to me. He did so in his thick German accent. You will stay with our Nigerian captain and his family and I will accommodate your captain. My captain was astonished and to say I was angry was an understatement. I made to advance on him and even though he was taller than me, I'd taken on bastards like this before. And this one, chief pilot or not, was going to feel my wrath. If you want to be a racist, fine. Just don't try it on me. I lost it, and my captain had to restrain me. Leave it, he said. We will deal with him in the morning. I had already mentally prepared myself for a short career with the company by taking on this man, and I would not be letting this go. I had heard about him. Many of us had. He'd kept it under the radar as much as he could, but he was obviously feeling he could deal with an uppity brown female pilot on his turf. He would soon learn that I was not any ordinary uppity brown female pilot. I was to be his worst nightmare. I did stay with my Nigerian colleague that night, who was also a very good friend, and we discussed the chief pilot's behaviour long into the night. He advised me to keep quiet and that his time would come. I respectfully disagreed, Any overt racism had to be dealt with swiftly. It had no place in our company or our country. When morning came, we were dispatched to the airport to meet our engineers and we flew the aircraft empty of passengers back to Lagos. On arrival, I went straight to my chief pilot's office where I, along with my captain, filed a complaint. I am happy to say that it was treated with the utmost importance and within weeks he was removed from his post. I didn't set out to be a caped crusader, and sometimes I think I pushed my luck. But what I did have was a sense of right and wrong, and given all that I had had to endure so far, I was not about to accept things that I didn't have to. I think it's important to mention here that despite my diminutive five foot six inch frame weighing nine stone, I could pack a punch, and if I was to succeed, I would have to be brave enough to use it. I tried to pick my battles in those early days, but I was young and combative at times, and I didn't always get it right. I had to learn to back down when I couldn't win that particular fight, and leave it until I could strategize enough to win the war. I had to learn to swallow my pride when I was wrong, and engage in meaningful debate on equal footing when I felt that I had a case. Life was full of lessons at that time, as it should be when you were that age. I learnt many lessons but I was still knocked back time and time again in my profession, not physically, but mentally, as I continued to fight for my place at the table amongst men. Many of my closest friends were men, and I frequently had the opportunity to debate the whys and wherefores of the profession I was attempting to navigate through. One of those closest to me at the time was our avionics manager. We had forged a great relationship, and he was one of the only ones at that time who knew I was gay. He was the one I went to for advice when I'd had a particularly difficult day, as I often did in those early days as a co-pilot. Interestingly, I was often second-guessed by my own passengers when I attempted tasks related to my job. I would often have to work out the weight and balance with the dispatchers in the passenger waiting rooms, and once satisfied that all the figures were correct, I would then direct the baggage loaders, how many bags into the different holes. More than once, a passenger would break free of our holding bays and end up beside me mid-flow. I would get a tap on the shoulder, whereupon the passenger would proceed to direct me directing the loaders. I remember on several occasions asking the passengers to step back behind the safety gate and let me get on with my job. Their bag would be loaded safely and carefully, but being told more than once that I couldn't possibly understand how to do it without direction, as I was only a woman child. Yes, that was a thing at the time. A woman child. I didn't know which was more insulting, being called a mere woman or a mere child. It seemed to be the order of the day to challenge the female crew members, whilst leaving the male crew members to get on with their job, 
safe in the knowledge that they knew what they were doing. When I wasn't fighting the passengers, I was fighting the weather. As we slipped into the wet season, the storms and bad weather made an appearance. As is the norm with the wet season, we often had to wait out the bad weather or get an early start after a huge thunderstorm had cleared everything out the night before. We were adept at dodging the build-ups, as we called them on our regular routes. It was normal for us to inch further and further out to sea on our Lagos Port Harcourt sectors as we altered course around the weather. Line squalls were not uncommon during the wet season, and many of them could be hundreds of miles long. All our aircraft were equipped with weather radar, and although we were grateful for it, it didn't help all the time, and was not particularly helpful in avoiding the severe turbulence that accompanied the storms and squall lines. Radar echoes showed areas of high precipitation, but this was not always where the severe turbulence was to be found. On several occasions I found myself hanging on for dear life as we inadvertently caught a large cell while attempting to deviate around it. Trying to hang on to the aircraft whilst we were tossed around and battered by heavy rain, to the accompaniment of screaming passengers, flying maps and various debris, along with leaky windows, was a scenario that was repeated many times during my career. It could be an unpleasant experience, penetrating dark rain-laden clouds with the accompanying lightning flashes punctuating the flight deck, wet feet and shirts along with a constant rocking motion engines absorbing heavy water ingestion and the resultant groans as the aircraft struggled to stay upright had me looking out to our enormous wings pleading with them to stay attached to the aircraft as i became more experienced i wouldn't worry so much as i reasoned that if they came off i would know about it without looking anyway on more than one occasion we experienced an engine surge due to the heavy water ingestion the engines had absorbed this is where the engine ingests too much water and cannot cope with the quantity and so interrupts the power stages. Often we rode out the storm with one fully functioning engine whilst we prepared to restart the other when the rain decreased. You were often too busy to be afraid of the weather, but every now and then Mother Nature reminded you of the need for respect. In very severe circumstances and with an aircraft whose ceiling, that's the maximum height, was 10,000 feet, we would drop low under the storm cells where we would sometimes, not always, get better visibility and a smoother ride. This often depended on if we had flatter terrain underneath us and could safely do so. In addition to our regular flying, we had to undergo base checks and renewals every six months. This was to make sure that we were still competent and able to carry out our duties as expected. On some regular flights, like the weekend trips to Jos in northern Nigeria, we would sometimes have an empty sector on the way back. If I was flying with a training captain, they would often use the opportunity to build your confidence as you increased your seniority in the right-hand seat. One of those training captains, Captain St. Pierre, would often retire to the back of the aircraft after I had sorted out the refuelling and tell me to get on with it. On one of our stops together as we opened the doors and did the paperwork in our seats, the refueller arrived. He looked at me and commented to the captain that I was a very small boy to be flying such a very big aeroplane. My captain immediately retorted that I was in fact a very small girl, but that I had been flying for many years and had lots of solo time. But he wouldn't believe him. Things were changing as I continued to build my hours. More and more airlines were being formed as aviation grew rapidly. This brought new pilots, new aircraft and new problems. Thank you for listening. As always, your reviews and comments are very much appreciated. Thank you to Lucy Ashby for the editing of this episode. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please do so on all of our social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, or send us an email. The sky is pink pilot at gmail.com. That's the sky is pink pilot at gmail.com. You can also leave comments or contact us or have a look at our website, which is skyispink.co.uk. All one word, skyispink.co.uk. In the next episode, my flight time increases substantially on my way to becoming a senior first officer. I am seconded to another company as a co-pilot for six months. And some colleagues pay a heavy price as aviation grows quickly in Nigeria. Thank you and goodbye.